We have Rob Hamilton with us today, and Rob has always been obsessed with music and began spending hours in front of his brother's stereo, absorbing everything he could about music at the age of four. Throughout his adolescence, Rob studied with several notable guitar masters, played well above his age category, and won many honors, including a full tuition scholarship to the famed Berklee College of Music in Boston, and was even awarded the coveted Best Berklee Entering Student Talent Scholarship for his playing. Rob then returned to Canada and completed his post-secondary education at Capilano College. After college, and now a full-time professional guitarist, Rob embarked on a career as one of the top session and touring musicians in Canada, playing for many years as a member of Canadian hard rock legend Lee Aaron's band, boy band Soul Decision, network signed vocal group Aliqua, Vancouver Island's owned Vince Vaccaro, and the Vancouver Institution Soul Stream, whose reign at bar none for over a decade is one of the great pieces of history of the Vancouver music scene. Rob's extensive studio, composing, and performing experience is featured on video games such as The Simpsons Hit and Run, in which he served as session guitarist and band leader. His composing is featured on television shows such as The L Word and The Dead Zone, with his hip-hop tune True Soul, co-written by Kia Kadiri and Scott Sanft. He appeared on countless stages as a sideman with Justin Bieber, Carly Rae Jepsen, Michael Buble, and Tom Jones, among others. After playing with renowned party band Famous Players, in 2010, Rob started up his own event band, Side One, which would forever change the course of his career from hired gun guitarist to multi-million dollar a year entrepreneur. As Side One expanded from Vancouver to Calgary, Toronto, and Seattle, employing hundreds of musicians and techs and doing close to 300 events a year for some of the biggest companies and events in the world. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> I am so excited to have you here today. Um, not only are you an excellent musician and a great guy, and we go back quite a long way, um, but you have a whole different angle on this, and I'm so happy to be able to talk about that for our listeners. You've gone in a different direction, ultimately, in music than maybe you imagined as a child. Big time. And I think looking at that perspective of different pathways to success in music is a really important conversation to have. Yeah. Um, so I agree. Well, I'm happy to be here. It's wonderful to see you. As you said, we go back. We do. Uh yeah. <laughs> Back to our Capilano College days. We went to school together there. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Those were uh, those were good times. They were indeed. <laughs> and uh yeah, I was uh I I was really fortunate actually to to go to Capilano. Like some people have asked like you did the whole thing about Berkeley and and stuff like that and it was one of the questions that I often get asked by people is, you know, you were at Berkeley and then you went to cap <laughs> you know it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it seems like a step down kind of thing and although berkeley i i met some wonderful people i played with some incredible musicians and and made <clears throat> made a lot of good friends there and learned a lot it was capilano that actually sort of informed what would become you know my career the relationships that i made there and instead of being you know one of 700 guitar players at berkeley um I was literally number one at Capilano out of mm -hmm. like 50 guitar players. So it was a lot more hands-on. It was a lot more playing. You know, I was, I was gigging. I met, you know, uh, musicians almost in the first couple of weeks that got me like a teaching position uh, at a local like school and that sort of thing. So it like, it kind of became what I really wanted it to like my career to be, which was like a working musician. And although, you know, like uh, some of my friends at Berkeley, they went on to, you know, uh, you know, write Uptown Funk and play with yeah. Prince. <laughs> and I was like, date Britney Spears. And I was like, oh, well, maybe I should have stayed there. <laughs> but no, I, I have no regrets. But, but that piece about being, you know, one of many fish in a big sea versus being the big fish in a in a smaller sea it it has its um perks being the standout guy in maybe a smaller pool and it it puts you front of the line for more opportunities maybe 
Yeah, I agree. There, there's, there's sort of obviously good and bad with both of those situations. If you go to somewhere like, I mean, side one uh, is in Toronto, and I found it like incredibly hard to break into that market just because you know there's so many people. But the one thing about that is that kind of, if you want to call it an ecosystem, is that everybody's amazing. <laughs> like mm-hmm. Everybody's mm-hmm. like, you know, every guitar player that I meet out there is like, oh my God, you're like one of the greatest guitar players I've ever heard. Is just, And it's because it is that like, there's so many people, it's this cutthroat kind of thing, or, you know, New York. So there's advantages to if you want to really like starve and become like a great player, uh, there is something to that. Whereas, you know, there's maybe not as much pressure in a smaller uh, pool, but you will get, you know, you may rise a little bit quicker if you can get the job done. I don't know. It's yeah. it's a it's a hard balancing act, and I'm glad that I got to participate in in both of those kind of worlds a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Well, to get us started, do you want to? Is there anything you want to flesh out from from your illustrious bio that I read <laughs> about your uh, story as a whole? Well, I realize now that I've got to, you know, like it, it makes it sound like uh, I am the millionaire from side one. It is like, no, no, all that money goes to many, many other places and warehouses and trucks and insurance. And- right. The business revenue. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I don't, uh, I don't get the big part of that, but yeah, um, uh, I don't know. There is uh, you. You mentioned to start this off, uh, like what I intended to be my career and what ended up being my career as two separate things. And and uh, I think that's one of the the valuable things about music is that there are so many avenues to sort of go down. And I think when I was I was fortunate when I was when I was a kid that uh, whether it's luck or just sort of happenstance or or however. It, it kind of worked out. I ended up going to a high school where they had a really good, you know, jazz program. And I didn't know it. Literally right up the street from me. (laughs) You went to Semiama, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we had this kind of famed uh, music teacher there. And when I was Actually, at the time I came into high school, it was White Rock Junior, and Semiamu was a was a separate school altogether. And the guitar player from the White Rock Junior jazz band was graduating, and he was going into Semiamu. And uh, so my sister, I was coming up to go into eighth grade at Semiamu or, or at White Rock Junior. And my sister, my sister said, "Listen." You're coming up. You're going to be going into high school next year, and uh, the guitar player from the jazz band is amazing and he's like he gets all the girls. So <laughs> if you want to be popular and get all the girls like Chris Joss, then you need to uh, you need to get into the jazz band next year when you come in and it was the 10th grade jazz band but I was going into the 8th grade. So she got me all the music, brought it home and um and I took it to my teacher at the time who was he was a classical guitar teacher, but we never did any sort of classical stuff. He just, uh, you know, we mainly worked on reading. And and I was actually, you know, a pretty pretty good guitar player by the time that I got into lessons. Like I knew all, you know, a lot of the things that I wanted to do, um, playing Led Zeppelin songs and, and that sort of thing. I could already sort of, I'd already kind of taught myself a lot of that stuff. So it was good, the things that he was giving me at the time, learning to read and learning, you know, some theory and scales and that sort of thing. So by the time you know, my sister came around with this jazz band music. He said, well, you know, I can probably get you up on this stuff. And we learned some of the chord shapes and that sort of thing. And then I went for an audition when I got into uh, the eighth grade and and my sister sort of set up with Mr. Prosnick, uh, this audition <laughs> for me. And, and uh, yeah, my little brother's really good and he wants to be in the 10th grade jazz band. He said, okay, we'll give him a, an audition. And I came in and, 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 and I did pretty well at that. And I guess I, I kind of got the gig. And so that, that kind of environment that I was in was already kind of really uh, fertile for me. There was a mm-hmm. lot of great musicians, young musicians at the time um, in that program. And then my guitar teacher had the, I don't know, incredible sense. Like we should all be blessed with this teacher who said, you know, and he probably had like, a million more things to teach me, but he he said, "Listen, you're getting into this this jazz stuff. There's this Yoda that lives down the street <laughs> in Crescent Beach, named Oliver Gannon, and I mean, this guy is 
literally like the top guy in the country. I don't know if he's going to take you on as a student because you're so young. And I was 12 at the time. And, uh, and so, you know, my teacher called up Oliver Gannon and said, I got this kid and I think he could be something. And, you know, and all he said, I don't know, I don't take students that young, but let's give him one lesson and see how he does. And, and I studied with Oliver until I went off to college (laughs) <laughs> and uh, that forever changed my life, and and yeah. and and that first lesson that I had with Oliver, it was very clear what I was going to do the rest of my life. I was going to become a jazz guitar player. Not only that, I was going to become, you know, a working guitar player, which is what Oliver was. Yep. Wow. I didn't have. Yeah, I didn't have. You know, at the at the time, like I didn't have a, a picture of what it was going to be. Like I just thought, well, I'll. I'll get good at this guitar thing and and I'll become Stevie Ray Vaughan. And <laughs> but when I saw Oliver, it was like, and I came from a family who they did not want me to be, you know, uh, a musician at all. So, you know, it was very business and let's go get your law degree or, you yeah. know, like something that will actually make you some money. And then, uh, and then I, you know, with Oliver, I could say, well, here's a guy that, you know, um, put his kids through college and owns this Mm -hmm. house in Crescent Beach. They've got a pool and, you know, he's, he's done something, you know, he's, he's not the millionaire that I would become, you know, (laughs) no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, But, uh, but he, you know, I could, I could say to my dad, I was like, look at this guy, you know, this is what I want to do. This is because, you know, as far as my dad knew, he's just like, oh, musicians get drunk and sleep on pool tables. And we do do that. Which is not wrong. (laughs) (laughs) It's just not all we do. Yeah. So uh, so then, yeah, that 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 be sort of and and also I should also mention at the time, like this was whatever it was, nineteen eighty eight, and all the guitar stuff, you know, back then, if you were a young guitar player, you were just like bombarded with guys with long hair telling you to play a million notes a minute, you right. know, and and a lot of hair metal at that point. A lot of hair metal at that point, and and. And that was, I was never interested in that music at all. I loved Van Halen and that was probably the extent of it. And uh, mm-hmm. and when I discovered jazz, I was like, this is my, this is my goth. This is my mm-hmm. rebellion, you know, to all of that stuff. This is, I could, you know, I was introduced to Joe Pass and Wes Montgomery and Oliver Gannon. And, you know, yeah. who, you know, I would spend hours learning, you know, I listen to his stuff and just lift his solos and and that sort of thing. So so it was really cool. And there was a lot of musicians at Sammy Ammo at the time where we were all influencing each other. I don't even think it was necessarily, you know, Proz gave us the kind of environment, but we were really just sort of speaking of like, you know, the the pool and that sort of thing. You get around musicians who have the same kind of thing. I remember, you know, a friend of mine studied with uh, Brad Turner and he mm-hmm. would come in with a tape from Brad's uh, lesson. We'd all sit around and listen to it. And then I'd come in with a tape from Ollie's lesson. We'd all sit around and like pick it apart. So, yeah. yeah. That, that learning community is that like, that's a magical thing that you just don't get everywhere. And and there were so many musicians that have come out of semi as well. Like professional musicians in the pop um, rock field now that have uh, initially came out of semi i'm not going to remember who they all are i know dave gen came out of semi i know like there are a few of them around you might know more of them but yeah there was there was a, it was you know and at the time you don't think it's weird until you like see some of the other schools you're like oh north delta is <laughs> obviously <laughs> you know or you know or whatever but like at the time i didn't realize how how like important and lucky uh, this this situation was yeah. going to be to my life, but yeah, it was, and and you know the I I was kind of part of that you know yeah. too uh, in creating, so that was kind of fun as well. So yeah, yeah, that's uh, that that aspect of community I think cannot be undervalued. Uh, oh, overvalued. Which way am I going? You know what I'm trying to say. We we want to really, really value that. Yes. <laughs> so here on the Vocal Lab, the idea is to sort of shine a light into the industry through the lens of what I wish I'd known then mm. that I know now. So with that in mind, if you were starting all over again, 
what would you do differently? Oh, man. Um, I mean, there's there's kind of uh, technical things that, like, from a guitar point of view that I wish I'd known. Like, now you have, now you can go on YouTube and you can watch Wes Montgomery, you know, right. play. If I would have had that when I was a kid, I would have been like, <laughs> it might have mm-hmm. changed a lot of things for me. Um, and, uh, but, you know, like, I honestly, Sarah, I can't really predict, you know, what my life would have looked like had I stayed in Boston or had I, you know, uh, whatever. Things things may have been different. So it's hard for me to say, like, you know, change this or or don't change this. But, um, but be open to... I'll, you know, whatever. I think like as we were, and maybe this will pick up where the story just left off, is I think I was convinced by the time I left high school, I'm going to move to the East Coast of the United States. I'm going to become a jazz musician. That's it. Like, here I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, quickly when I was down there, I mean, there was the pragmatic point of it, which is, yes, I had a full scholarship to Berkeley, which paid for all my tuition. But what they don't tell you is, you know, you've got to stay in residence until you're 21. It's one of the most expensive schools in the entire state. So even though my tuition was taken care of, it's like, it was crazy expensive for my parents to keep me there, uh, just to live in Boston at the time. I mean, the Canadian dollar was 50 cents to the US dollar. So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so and living in Boston ain't cheap. No. So so uh so they sort of politely kind of went, you know, is there some way we can get you back to Canada? Mm-hmm. And I and at that point I was starting to feel a little homesick for Canada like any time there was uh a long weekend I would go and visit my friends up at McGill in Montreal mm-hmm. and and so I started to think, well, maybe I'll yeah, maybe I'll go to to McGill and um and then McGill sort of said, well, we don't take people in the spring semester. So I thought, well, I'll do, I'll come back home to Vancouver. I'll do one semester at Capilano. And, uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll go to Montreal in, in the fall kind of thing. And when I came back to do that spring semester at Capilano, I just kind of fell in love with, you know, Vancouver again. And I was like, there's all these great musicians here. I was studying with, you know, Ihor Kukuruza and mm-hmm. Bill Kuhn and 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 Brad was up there. And there was just so many, like, and up and talk about up and coming musicians who are now, you know, at that time you had, you know, Darren Radke and Sharon Minamoto and yourself and like all these, you know, wonderful, you know, great, great like masters of music, even at that time. I mean, just being around somebody like Darren Radke was like it was incredible for, for a young me. And so I thought, okay, yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can sort of like, you know, just stay here and don't worry about this Montreal sort of thing. And, (laughs) and that was, yeah. So I was, yeah, you know, being open to, to that big change was, as I said before, like very valuable for me. Yeah. Yeah. What, what year did you come to cap? I came in, uh, it would have been, the spring of 95 yeah okay. i graduated in 93 so yeah spring of 95 okay so we're not we're so you came you would have been in like third year you came uh, third yeah year. because because i sort of like i transferred from berkeley and with music it's not like mathematics <laughs> you know it's no. like you know we you know the first year is you learn this and the second year you learn this and there's this very sort of like even the p- learning the piano is sort of like this but learning the guitar is kind of all over the place but especially with a jazz degree and i remember when i got to cap and and mike reevely was the uh, the head of the program there and he's like oh yeah i went to cap and i was like oh really He's like, oh yeah, we do exactly. It's exactly like, you know, Berkeley theory and and that sort of thing. And and uh, and I was like, oh okay, great. Uh, so you know, and I I tested quite high. One of the things that when you get to Berkeley is you take a test and they put you into like if and everybody's kind of at different levels. So if you test mm-hmm. into the Harmony Three, but you're a first year person, what they do is they put you in a class which, you know, is other people in a similar situation. Maybe you you have a good basis in theory, but we need to catch you up on the Berkeley way. So they'll do, 
you know, Harmony 1 and 2 in the first, like, two weeks. They'll just speed mm-hmm. you through it. And there's enough people at Berkeley where you can have an entire class of first-year Harmony 3 students. So when I got mm-hmm. to CAP, and, you know, I'd already completed all my Berkeley theory. And so Mike said, well, yeah, it's, this is just like Berkeley, you know, so we'll put you in. <laughs> and I just about failed the uh, the 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 Capilano theory course, even though that was my bread and butter. I loved theory. It's mm-hmm. just, it was so, yes, it was probably Berkeley theory that he was teaching, but it was 20 years old or 30 years old or something. And and uh, and so I was like, you know, I would end up getting into fights with Mike Reevely most of the, <laughs> most of the class and, and then eventually just not showing up. Oh, I did a lot of not showing up to theory. <laughs> I I definitely had to take theory 100. Uh, I, de- I at least took it twice, if not three times, because there was a lot of not showing up to that class. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, and I was kind of like, I was, if you remember, I was a bit of a dick back in the, uh, uh, I, was, <laughs> I was a bit arrogant. And so, but I was arrogant even with Mike. I would be like, you know, I've literally studied advanced modal harmony with Steve Roshinsky. He has written the book, like literally written mm-hmm. the book on advanced modal harmony. And we're, we're in an argument right now about someday my prince will come and the passing diminished chord and stuff like that. I'm like, Mike, you're wrong. You're wrong. This is just like <laughs> asshole, you know, 19-year-old kid. <laughs> so that was me. <laughs> All right. So if that's what you would do differently, uh, what did you do right, Rob? <laughs> uh, or is that... Arguing with Mike Reevely. Is that yeah, what you did right? I, I don't know. I didn't know any other <laughs> any other way. Uh, but <clears throat> but but yeah, I think uh, you know the things I I did right. Uh, I guess uh, was you know like once I got kind of a a plan in place. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we're back in Vancouver, and <clears throat> as far as being like the next Oliver Gannon you know, which is what I I really wanted to be. At the time, this was like the sort of, you know, 90s, and there was a lot of like acid jazz kind of happening. So you mm-hmm. could go and get gigs where you'd essentially be playing bebop, but there'd be like a funky beat, you know, yep. like when we'd be playing at the Chameleon or the Backstage Lounge or something like that. And uh, and that's where I kind of met people like, you know, Coco Love Alcorn and... Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Rake Arroway and Randall Stoll and and uh, and I was like, okay, well, yeah, I can start getting into. It. it doesn't have to all be like kind of bebop and you know. This was kind of you know this is still kind of jazz in a way, and uh, and a lot of those people that I started to meet at that time, they all kind of would supplement their income in other ways. So like session playing, or maybe they're playing in cover bands and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I could, you know, start doing that. And I would start to get calls for, for things like that. Um, doing, uh, you know, playing in some cover band, uh, doing weddings and, mm-hmm. uh, and, and stuff. And like, and at the time there was also these, this sort of like, they were hiring a bunch of bands to go over to Asia, you know? Yes. So, so like, did you ever play in any of those bands? I played in those bands, but we didn't go. Like, okay. we, we put it together, we did all the work, and then the yeah. agent said, uh, no. So that that was kind of my situation. Well, in a, in a slightly different. So there was a great guitar player in town named Joe Cruz, and Joe... You know, actually, uh, I, uh, I'm sure you know Joe quite well, but uh, he's wonderful, wonderful. I don't. Gu- oh, really? No. Nope. Um, yeah, uh, he's kind of a songwriter now, living in LA, but uh, mm-hmm. was kind of a um, a piece around Vancouver for a long time. Played with Sarah McLaughlin eventually, mm-hmm. and, and that sort of thing. Just wonderful guy. I actually met him when I was when I was uh, studying with Oliver, Oliver kind of put us together. He said, hey, here's a, you know, a guy who wants to start getting, playing jazz a little bit more. And he just lived kind of up in uh, Delta. And and so I remember in high school going over to Joe's house and us just playing tunes. But a wonderful guy. And and he was in one of those bands that was over in Asia and also with uh, somebody that I went to high school, speaking of semi-grad, is Kyle Radomski. And I guess Joe had met a girl over in, you know, the Philippines when they were playing over there. And and Kyle came back and said, "Listen, we've got a whole bunch of dates around Vancouver with this cover band, and and uh, 
and Joe's still back in the Philippines. Why don't you, you know, can you pick up some of these dates with us? And I thought, mm -hmm. okay. And, and it was like, you know, real, real top 40 kind of stuff at the time. Yeah. And I never really like learned any of that kind of stuff. And I thought, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And so I went and, and played with this band. We did a bunch of tours around uh, BC. They used to book, like Feldman used to book these, these sort of rooms, like, you know, in in uh, Courtney and, you know, yep, you would play Merit. the loft in, in Merritt. <laughs> yeah. So so I would, you know, I would be in college all week. And then on the weekends, we would go out and play these these crappy little bars in, in Port Hardy and the like. And yes. I was playing uh, cover band <laughs> music. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. I do. I was playing uh, the same rooms. <laughs> yeah. So... So, uh, and in that band was, uh, was Mike Henry, who's a great, uh, Vancouver vocalist. And so Mike was getting pretty sick of going overseas and playing with this band. He wanted to put his own kind of funk band together. And, and, uh, so he put together this little cover band called Funk Delicious with me. And, uh, and we started to hire some other, uh, people around town. And that introduced me to Randall, uh, mm -hmm. Stoll and Randall eventually would become my boss in Soulstream. Mm -hmm. And Soulstream was just like, again, another kind of life-changing event for me. I was, you know, I would go and see Soulstream when I was in college and it was like the top session musicians in town. And yeah. I was like, whoa, you know, these guys are, you know, like, this is, this is where it's at. And then eventually, yeah. you know, I got to uh, play in that band for whatever it was, 10 years. And, and again, just like, being open to, okay, well, maybe the, the downside of this is that, you know, I never got the, you know, I was still playing a little bit of jazz, but like I started to become known as the cover band kind of guy mm -hmm. and started to get phone calls for that and uh, and less phone calls for, you know, the Alma Street Cafe and, and, yeah. uh, and that sort of thing. So while my heart was still in you know, in jazz and, and to a certain degree, I was still like, this was a soul stream was really just a bunch of jazz musicians, just yeah. again, just playing funk. So there was still an element to that, but you know, this it was part, like the smartest funk band ever, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right? Like musically smartest funk band ever. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was something else. It was, it was a very special thing. So I was, I was very fortunate to be a part of that. And, and there was so many like sort of offshoot things. Now I was like sort of recognized, you know, I started getting those calls for, you know, doing touring and, and, and uh, sessions and, and that yeah. sort of thing. So, so that was all like, I guess, like, as you said, like, the the advice that I would have given the young me is, like, yeah, just be, like, sort of open to, you know, maybe this isn't going to be, you know, what you planned on. But, yeah. uh, but it was, it was, it was, it was great for me and led to now what would be, you know, my career. Yeah. So we're in an industry that sees hugely different levels of of like music education and theory that yep. supplements talent. Some have high levels of formal education like yourself. Some are completely self-taught with zero theory. Um, right. And so we've talked a bit about your musical education, but do you want to talk about how that has specifically impacted your work? Oh, yeah. Both as a, a player and as a band leader? Which we'll that's get really, into the band leader stuff in a minute, but yeah, that's such a great question, um, and it's a question I've never been really asked before because mm -hmm. there is this there's this weird thing that happens in music, and it's usually by people that are kind of uneducated. And let's face it, like there's been you know millions and trillions of the greatest musicians in the world who don't have any music education, yep, and. In fact, like many, many of my biggest influences are those people. But there seems to be this kind of like weird thing that we have where we need to, people that do have some sort of music education 
are sometimes vilified. And, uh, and I think it comes from a place of insecurity sometimes. If you don't know something, then you have to somehow like resent it in some sort of way and create this world. So I think the common trope is if you know a bunch of theory, it will take away from your mojo or something like mm -hmm. that. Like you won't be expressive. You know, you'll mm -hmm. sound like a robot. I don't want to learn to read because, you know, I'll become a robot. Um, and all the great musicians that I ever, like the really great musicians that I ever saw, they can do all of that, you know, the nerdy stuff. Like playing with, again, with Randall, you know, I remember doing a session with him and somebody just plopping, you know, a drum chart in front of him. And if you've ever seen a drum chart, I mean, it looks like, you know, a fly took a shit on it. It's like, it's it just like, does. it. like I thought reading guitar music is difficult. And not only was he just sight reading this, it was just like to a click, powerful groove. And these fills he's throwing down are just like, you know, as as happening as they could ever kind of, and yeah. I just went, that's, that's the real level. And then, you know, when I was at Berkeley, it was the same thing. You know, I was thrown into these, these kind of reading labs with other guitar players. And the old joke is, how do you get a guitar player to shut up? You put a piece of music in front of them, right? <laughs> and, and here's a bunch of like the world's greatest guitar players. And they're all just like sight reading this stuff. And they can really play, like really, really. They all play like Jeff Beck and they can read, you know? And it's like, well, no one's going to tell these guys they, they're not playing with mojo or, you know, yeah. with, with, you know, some sort of emotion. So I think like all of that, that sort of bad rap that getting to know your instrument and, and, you know, knowing theory has all just comes from the people that are super resentful about not knowing that. Because if you take the really, you know, great guys, uh, it's, you know, they all know their shit and, mm -hmm. you know, can, uh, can make you cry at the same time. Yeah. You know, so I've always, that's the thing that I've always like wanted to be. You know, like that, yeah. having that kind of level of understanding and, and being able to, you know, do the thing that we all want to do is move people with, with our playing. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I haven't asked you your band leader questions yet, which I'm going to in a minute. But um, uh, if you did not have the ability to read and write music you would probably not have been able to step into that role as a band leader and do what you ultimately did with side one because you guys work with charts in that band uh, so that you can hire in the way that you do, right? So all of that has has involved the capability of reading music, yes? Well, oh, yes, I think there is, uh, and I'm going to, I'll, I'll address the side one specifically in a, in a second, but I think like in my career, the, the opportunities that I've been given sometimes don't require that and sometimes mm -hmm. they do. So like I was musical director for uh, a production of American Idiot, uh, the Green Day musical mm -hmm. uh, a few years ago, or Rent, I've done Rent as well. And I think like that you just, and I played musicals since I was in college, you know, as a part of like, you know, just as a, a player trying to get yep. income and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So you, you need to be able to read in that kind of world. Now with side one specifically, you know, I, there are many musicians in our camp that don't read, don't know theory, mm -hmm. any of this stuff. So I need to be able to speak a whole bunch of languages. Yeah. Uh, with our horn players, you know, I've done all of the the charts. Well, I, I did all the charts when we started the band, mainly because I just needed to save money. But the, mm -hmm. the wonderful thing is with like a horn player, you know, I can hire horn players like we've, we've done gigs in California and we've done gigs in, you know, uh, uh, Miami or something like that. I don't need to fly one of my Vancouver musicians down that has done the gig a bunch of times. I can hire local guys because we have these charts and they just come in, they read them read them down perfectly. Yep. And and so having the ability to write that, well, first of all, that saved me a whole bunch of money. I don't need <laughs> to hire, you know, an arranger to do that for me. And plus, it's a nice little creative outlet. Like, there's a lot of songs that we do with Side One that don't have horns on them. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, like, create a horn part. And, like, there's been people, like, in the band that be like, 
now when I hear that song, like I hear your horn part that you wrote there. I was like, that's right. That's about a little, you know, like, you know, as far as being creative within a cover band, let's face it, Sarah, like yeah. I don't have a lot of opportunities. So I take yeah. it when I can yeah. get it. And, uh, and so, and so that's, a, that's a little kind of, you know, a nice little perk of that. And to speak the language, uh, we don't rehearse with the band, you know, mm-hmm. like we've, I think, you know, with our Vancouver team, we had two rehearsals, you know, 10 years ago where we just ran set one in the first <laughs> rehearsal and we ran set two. And then since then, we've never, ever rehearsed. And yeah. the way that I, you know, and there's, there's people in the band that don't read music. Mm-hmm. They don't have to read music. They, as long as they can transcribe the stuff on their own, that's fine. But there's a language that I can speak to those that do and those that don't that, you know, we can say, like, when we have to talk about, you know, you know, uh, uh, certain chords and that sort of thing, like, it, it's very easy to do. But but the way that I've structured it, I've sort of embraced the fact that we have musicians coming from all over, you know, the musical spectrum. That's one of the yeah. wonderful things about about the band. But, like, to sort of push back, like, inside one, yes, we have charts, Sometimes I've also found that to be not such a good thing. Like there's people that I purposely made the kind of what I call the master charts kind of a little bit vague. So people do have to dig in and do the work. Like, you know, there's one thing to play, not that we play this song, but I always use it as an example. It's like, you know, brown eyed girl is G, C, and D, right? right? And but if you listen to brown eyed girl and you listen to the guitar part, it's actually kind of an elaborate. And if I'm just a session player sitting down and I haven't really listened to the song and I'm just playing G, C, and D, you're not going to last very long inside one. You know, yeah. I want people to do the work. So when we get on stage and it's the first time and I hear a keyboard player and I was like, oh, they haven't checked out this shit, you know. They they don't know what they're doing. They're just reading my super vague chart. So I've, you know, I've I've had this love-hate relationship with our charts in the band where it's like, yeah, it can it can create create some laziness. Like people can just rely on that and just kind of get through the gig. And those aren't the people that I want to hire. They don't last yeah. very long. Yeah. yeah. That's I think that that's a, a really important distinction to make. I think too, when you're talking about the languages of music. There's sort of three different ones. There's there's the ones where people just straight up know their theory and read and you can talk about G C D and your, you know, whatever the half diminished chord and the blah 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 blah, all that stuff. There's the people who don't know what any of that means. So there's the they know all the things, they know none of the things. And then there's there's a middle ground where they don't necessarily know you can't put a chart in front of them and they can read it, but they can speak numbers. And when I talk to students I talk who don't necessarily read, I talk a lot about the importance of having that skill because um, if you don't want to put the time in and learn to read, at least know that you can talk about it doesn't matter what what key the song is in. You can talk about the one chord and the four chord and the six chord. And then it doesn't matter if you've got a horn player and a guitar player and they're, you know, potentially playing in different keys. It's the same thing if you're talking in numbers. And it's it's a more like universal language, whether you know all your um, bits and pieces or not. I like that too, even not necessarily just the chord stuff, like, but the, you know, the actual note stuff. So when we're working out like background vocals or something like that, then I can say, you know, to Patrick, oh, no, you start on the third or you start on the fifth kind of thing. And then becomes like, you know, you can rely on, on that, that kind of stuff. Absolutely. So I think that language of numbers is incredibly useful in talking about music. And it's a a really good middle ground for different levels of learned knowledge. Big time. Yeah. Thanks for joining me today, you guys. That was Rob Hamilton. And as you heard, he's got lots of great stuff to share. So I hope that you join us again on Thursday, where you'll hear part two of my interview with 